I'm just going to double check. You can hear me, right? Yeah. yeah. OK. So the mic's working. Um, I'm Susan Stinson. I'm the writer in residence at Forbes until June 5th. I'm stepping down after five years in June. And there's an opening for a new writer in residence. So check out the library website if you're interested in that. And um, we're down, this is the local history, local novelist reading series. So um, we're down to four more, including this one, three more readings I'm doing, and one that Lisa Downing is doing, which is the next reading in March. That's um, crime fiction with Dean Flower, um, Michael Ponzer, um, who wrote The Hanging Judge, which won the, math, or is a finalist for Massachusetts Book Award, and Susan Kelly. Um, out of darkness. And that is also the launch event for All Hamptons Read the Maltese Falcon by Dashiell Hammett. So there'll be a bunch of programs around that if you're interesting, interested. And then there's the other two um, programs in the series are Shay's Rebellion, which should be fantastic, a poet, a playwright, and a historian from the Armory. And um, we'll end with a celebration of local novelists in May. But. Tonight, um, I feel like I'm forgetting something, but I guess I'm not. Um, oh, yes, I am. This is Remembering Those Gone. And um, this morning, we heard that Elise Bernier Feely, um, the wonderful local um, history librarian, is ill. So she's not going to be able to talk tonight about Bridge Street Cemetery. Um, I'm going to read uh, something really brief about it, because I also love the Bridge Street Cemetery, and I knew that um, there might be folks here especially interested in that. And then we're going to have two fantastic poets, Leslie Newman and Mark Hart. And it's the book launch for, um, um, it's the book launch for Leslie's um, new book. So this is all very exciting. And I, I'm going to say now, and I may remind you later, that there are books for sale up there. So if you like what you hear, please do check out the books. Um, yeah. So there's no replacing Elise for her passion and depth of knowledge. Um, but I, I thought I'd offer you a short piece with some of my notes from the cemetery. Um, I give cemetery tours there uh, that center around the years Jonathan Edwards preached in Northampton, but tonight I, I thought I'd do something different. There are so many stones that I love that I never get to mention on the tour. And since we can't look at them now with the cemetery buried so deeply in snow, um, I thought I'd read you what three of the stones themselves say. Um, with some of my notes about the grave sites. And I, I'll, before I start that, I, I just also want to say that, you know, many of the graves are not marked. The Puritan settlers who started the cemetery wanted simple stones. The graveyard was pointedly not in the churchyard, but in the center of town. Poor people tended to be buried around the edge of the cemetery, with people considered prominent in the center. Women and children tended to have graves marked with wooden crosses, which are gone. And I want to remember them, all of those whose graves we no longer know or see, including um, some of the Abenaki people who are buried on Hospital Hill. But here, are a few, um, I'm going to do three sites, um, who we can see. Louisa and Eleanor, next to Jane Lyman Whitney, to his right, set back. The, the stones say, Louisa, daughter of Samuel and M.M. Goddard, wife of Josiah Dwight Whitney, England, 1812, Cambridge, May. 1882. Eleanor Goddard, daughter of J.D. and Louisa Whitney, wife of Thomas Allen, Northampton, November 1858, Ecoven, France, May 1882. So that's mother and daughter who di both died in Europe in different places on the same day. And the stone says, 
They were lovely and pleasant in their lives, and in their deaths, they were not divided. Two, cemetery is morning, bright light this morning. The stone says, Lily Alice, only child of John and Alice Day, age four years, six months, seven days. Lily, our darling lamb, 1880, blank, all carved deep, much deeper than most of the stones, more deeply than her father's stone beside her, which I could barely read, and I didn't see her mother's at all. Three, James Lyman Whitney. A rectangle, slatish stone, maybe four feet by three, pale gray with scratchy patches of dust, mottled dusty rust or lichen molds, chipped edges, concrete edged by a thin stretch of asphalt, three quarters of a finger's length peeled up and gone in places, leaving packed dirt. The whole stone has a height of a finger's length, measured it cold against my own hands, brown pine needles, January thaw, 2002. No commas, dashes instead of periods. The stone says, James Lyman Whitney, born in Northampton, November 28, 1835. A man high-minded, pure, affectionate, and very human. The charm of books drew him in early youth, and his life's work was the helping of others to their use and enjoyment. After long years of loving service in the Boston Public Library, for four years its chief, he said to the, his friends of his course of life, the children of Israel were 40 years in reaching the promised land. My land flowing with milk and honey has been in my possession every day for 40 years. He died in service, September 25th, 1910. And now the poets. Mark D. Hart grew up on a wheat farm in the Palouse region of Eastern Washington State and now lives in an apple orchard in Western Massachusetts. He is a licensed mental health counselor in private practice, the guiding teacher for the Bodhisara Dharma community and a religious advisor at Amherst College. He has taught religious studies at both Seattle University and Smith College. He began writing poetry in 2003 after the death of his father. Since then, his work has appeared in Atlanta Review, Rattle, Poetry East, Margie, The Midwest Quarterly, Tar River Poetry, The Spoon River Poetry Review, and numerous other journals. His beautiful first book of poetry, Boy Singing to Cattle, won the Pearl Poetry Prize and was a finalist for the 214 Massachusetts Book Award. These poems shimmer like wheat, they preach like a muskrat, they are a landscape with depths. Please welcome Mark. Thank you. This is uh, a wonderful to read to such a large audience. And uh, I'm not sure about this looking <laughs> over my shoulder, but uh, I think I'll, I'll, I'll be OK. Um, so as, uh, as was said, I started writing at the death of my father. I really hadn't thought of myself as a poet before then. And there's something about his death. Um, it opened a voice in me that I started to hear that wanted to speak, and this is really the fruit of that. Um, and writing for me, at least in the initial stages, I'm not sure if it's so true now, was really a way to deal with my grief, and also a way of recording um, how I began to perceive things in light of death. There's a way that death 
sheds light on life. And so um, I'd like to begin with a poem that's um, set in my childhood. We had, um, I grew up on a wheat farm, and um, we used to have pigs, but by the time I was around, there weren't any pigs anymore. They were way more trouble than they were worth. Um, and so, but there was a pig house left, and that was our playhouse. And this is a poem about that, Torching the Playhouse. It had been an old pig barn, and we squealed to have it as our own, mopped it out, washed the windows, dragged into it desks, chairs, and a couch resembling Freud's that now lights into smoke and flame and vanishes like a dream. Labs with colored chemicals whose jars beckoned like crayons to idle minds, exploring a middle earth between innocence and adulthood, fall and shatter as tables and shelves give way beneath them. Posters, calendars, remnants of the haunted house for Halloween flower into flame. We watch them go, watch flames lick the rough boards, hungry. Inside, because we lit the match, until heat drives us out and we stand back, bright-eyed, flames crawling from rafters, scrambling up the roof, leaping off the ridge, roaring, bestial, eating out the blackening core more swiftly than we had guessed. Arsonists of our childhood, privy to the plans to burn it anyway, we seize the chance to fire this final rocket, to send something of our intensity skyward, adrenal, no hope of recovery. We want to see the deep death latent in all things, play with it, welcome it, fill our ignorance of it, let the structure collapse, and its matter and time implode into the black holes of our eyes. So I hope you like death. <laughs> <laughs> I do. You're going to hear about it. Um, this next poem is, is a little more of the lighter side of that subject. Um, looking back at something that was a very big part of my memories of childhood. My parents had bridge parties. And um, several times a month, it, it's, they, they belonged to two couples clubs, and there was a woman's club. And so it, it was always happening. And they were big partiers. And um, so this is a, a poem about that. Real drinkers. There was party drinking, holiday drinking, marriage drinking, Funeral drinking, card playing drinking, been working too hard drinking, bad weather ruining the crops drinking, and let's have a drink drinking. <laughs> Voices and laughter filled the house as the bottles drained. A small Manhattan skyline on the counter. Dad at the bar, or me as a teen, mastering the mixology portion of his universe. The shot glass rested unused on the shelf. Real drinkers, Dad said, never added pop or anything sweet. We were not alcoholics. We were Catholics. <laughs> we had a religion to uphold in the face of Bible Christians and Mormons sobering the West. Dad's gospel? Never take yourself too seriously. Straight, it burned like a foretaste of hell. On the rocks, it jingled. Each sip poured amber waves of grain alcohol over the brain until it floated, edges melting. Whiskey, the great smoother overer and sociabilizer, produced states called snockered and soused, one S sound after another sliding towards sex and sleep, maybe sin or cirrhosis. <laughs> but never stumbling or shit-faced. Real drinkers held their liquor. The real drinker's etiquette, offer refills quickly, nudge but never insist. Look the other in the eye when you toast. Let life distill to two people meeting, poised on the rim of oblivion. With a flat clink of the glass, the straight shot of his eyes meeting yours, 
my father would say, here's looking at you. <laughs> so here we are, poised on the rim of oblivion. So this is, I'd like to read the poem that begins my collection, and it's actually, I don't know that it's the actual first poem that I wrote after my father's death, but it's the, one, the first one I remember writing after his death. Um, and it came to me meditating uh, I was in the living room, and I just felt this thing forming in my mind, and each line would come. It would maybe edit it a little bit, but it would just each line would come. And I sort of realized what I wanted to say and that this, this sentiment that was there. Um, it's called Burying My Father. Your body lies beneath my hand, a cold stone. You look good, better than when dying perhaps, but fixed like a photograph fresh from a chemical bath. What kind of death in people makes them love this preservation? I want to drag you out of that box by your armpits, throw you in the back of the car, and bury you in the garden like a dead cat. Nothing between you and the raw soil you tilled. Billions of hungry mouths ready to eat you out of the limits of your skin. Guts exploding with gases like a newborn star. The grass by the fence row sparkling with spring rain, waving in the wind. Roots reaching softly down into your corpse to resurrect it. Thank you. It felt like a death worthy of my father. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to read a poem I don't usually read for several reasons. Um, one is that it's long. It's, it's five pages, and that takes a lot of time. Um, the second is that it's a dangerous poem to read in public, because uh, it's a very raw kind of poem. It's about the, the last time that I saw my father alive. And I felt like I needed to tell the story. And so the poem, unlike this poem that came line by line, almost was born intact in my head. This one has been labored over and labored over and labored over. And I still don't quite feel like I, could, I got it right, or maybe I'll never get it right. Um, now it's in print. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it's, it says something. Um, We're saying, my father died of hydrocephalus, which is water on the brain, um, which is supposedly treatable. And he had an operation to put a shunt between his brain, and it would bring the, the fluid off of his brain down into his body's cavity. But it kind of all went haywire. And uh, he went into atrial fibrillation on the operating table. And then they, they punctured a, an intestine with the shunt and didn't know it. So he became septic. And um, he recovered. But then he never really recovered, and it took him about a year to die. But it was very clear that he was dying. And the hydrocephalus, the pressure on his brain, made him just shut down more and more and move less and less till he could only eat, really. He was really only moving his mouth and um, barely his arm. And he could open his eyes and maybe turn his head a little bit. But he, and he stopped talking for the most part. This poem is called The Vanishing Point. At the crossroads of quarters by the nurse's station, you slouch in your wheelchair, swallowed by sleep. I shake you, and you suck the air to straighten up, eyes void, expression flatlined, walls, ceiling, floor, receding blank behind you, meeting at infinity. The week of my stay, Ladies in billowing clouds of white and wispy hair taxi on the runway for clearance. Old men sink into themselves like jack-o'-lanterns a week past Halloween. But you sit stiff, a ma mannequin the nurses have dressed and molded. The buried shunt, snake of plastic tube beneath your skin from skull to chest, implanted to relieve the pressure on your brain, at first drained your mind, Uncle Harry, dead for 30 years, comes to visit you. 
Your son-in-law flies a plane and parks it at your door. But then words followed scents down the serpentine drain. Now you sit in silence, eyes often closed, as if seeing takes too much. Sometimes staring at the tray, juicy fruit, sweet frosting you desire. And I jump, buck private to your order, waiting for some sign of your will. When done, you simply do not open for the spoon. You rarely move. Only neck and jaw and eyes keep their animal birthright of motion. I massage your shoulders. Once again, the boy behind you in the chair that neither kid nor cat dare claim, combing your hair while you watch TV. Only once do I see you move your arm. A pretty nurse comes in and breaks the spell. You reach for her hand. Less by intention, perhaps, than by a reflex running down a well-trod neural path. And in that gesture, I feel a lifetime of wishing you would reach for me. Your breathing, the room. It's off-white walls and metal bed, artifacts of your life stuck on walls, the you fully haired and hormoned in your P-51. Three swastikas proudly painted on the rim of the cockpit. Faces of the brood who resemble you in name and form. And framed by the window, the hills of the Palouse, where you farmed for 40 years. It is all growing still, this life. One breath at a time, contained in four walls, not your own. And a body turning to stone. And yet it seems for years at home you had practiced being mute and frozen, sinking ever lower in your chair, hiding in your earphones and TV, ever less a presence, vanishing before our eyes. You named me for a general, tried to make me tough, filleting this heart on the edge of what you called humor. Mark will make a good wife someday. Were you ashamed of me? Under your command, Colonel, I have learned what I know about silence and turning to stone. But of late, I have wished again to be flesh. A good day comes toward the end of my stay, when the blue of your eyes meet mine. I speak of frozen mornings, donning rubber boots and overalls to kick broken bales of hay off the bed of the old Dodge idling driverless and compound low along the flat. Hungry hordes of cattle plodding behind, snorting steam, plopping piles, and of summer mornings when the dune-like hills lay soft and round in the glowing, growing light, sweet with the smell of dew, of oven-baked dusty afternoons, vast spaces dry and open to the sky, the drone of the combine the swat of a cow's tail. I thank you for giving me this land, the rapture of our ever-changing moods, the dirt, the dust, the mud, the greening, gilding, then final browning of it, a rich life, an inner landscape I inhabit, with you there, almost grown from earth itself, its keeper, prodding it to yield its fruit. And while I speak this litany, you look at me. I cannot know if you understand. I cannot see behind those eyes. But when I end, I love you, Dad. You lurch and say, I love you, too. Four words. Four words so quickly out. Were they a reflex following my cue? Yet you never lurched to answer, how are you? Had you heard it all, had you come from your own vanishing to reach for me? The next day, my last day, the plane for Boston waiting, your eyes closed, exhausted, I feed you, locked within your browning senses. I open the curtains, close to better see the tube, let the sun bl blaze bright wings across the wall. With a freedom born of nothing left to say or do, released from your command, I weep. You raise your lids, 
like pulling a cord of a heavy blind and look upon me crying, tears calling you from your stupor. Release on me this one last time the blue of your sky. Then fatigue takes you. I sit and sit and stare at you, this my final look, stand to walk and look again, your thin hair almost white, the pigment patches on your scalp, your whiskers flecked with gray, the hair on your arms. I walk toward the door, turn, your apartment in limbo, you sunk in rest, breathing, your head from behind, slightly to one side. So sort of as a companion poem to Bearing My Father, I have another one of a little lighter sort called The Grave of My Father, which I think he would have liked better. <laughs> I must place with you, like T King Tutankhamun in his tomb, the things you will need in the afterlife to know who you are. A deck of cards, some whiskey, a pocket knife, bailing wire, and duct tape. There must be duct tape. Some stocks to trade, a picture book about the war. You are a simple man. You do not need jewels or robe. But a wife would be handy, I think, to tell you how to dress, to tell you what to do, someone to resist, and someone not your wife to flirt with. I'm not sure how I'll get them in. <laughs> these things don't go over well these days, you know. I would place in there the open sky, packets of seeds, and lots of loam. Well, I guess the last you will not need, for you are lying in it. Nor the sky, for it is always with you in the blue of your eyes. With these few things, I know you will be comfortable, and not too lost or at loose ends in the fields of the beyond. So, um, as you may have gathered from the, the long poem, The Vanishing Point, my father was a pilot um, in World War II. And um, this next poem is uh, a story about his remarkable survival. Um, flight from Duxford. He, was a, he flew a um, bomber escort out of Duxford, England, um, over Germany. Flight from Duxford. Laughter, smoke. The triumph of your luck last night at poker fade behind you with the hedged fields of England. And in your chariot of steel, shearing the wind, humming its hymn of glory, a constant drone beside your brothers, you gaze over clouds to that blue yonder and an ever receding rim of earth. You peer down into passing chasms to the gray furrows of the North Sea. Alone in your cockpit, there is only the vast morning of your youth and the trip before you. Not long ago, you were riveting at Boeing. Now a P-51 bears you, buoyed by the invisible. But flying back, a sudden cavity in sound, an eerie whisper of air enshrouds your fuselage. That class you skipped, the one that taught you how your life raft inflates, Matters now, three miles off the coast of Holland. Hydraulics bleeding, hit by flak or the blast of your own bombs. Your prop stopped and the sea rising to meet you. At a thousand feet you bail. One short swing and I was in the water. I had almost figured it too close. Just floating, embraced by the sea, brine like blood in your mouth. Above, your buddy marks you with carrion circles, eyes on the gas gauge while your vital heat drains. You see your mother coming to the door, the telegram 
the wave of the news taking her down. There is a great tenderness where all things touch, where the puny will is weightless and a strength. You share the valve barehanded, the rescue launch reports, reaching you, hanging on, half inflated. Why did you survive? Never a report of your thoughts 30 years later, when the tractor tipped you off, split you open between the legs, and left you in the summer fallow, staring up at that constant blue, gauging your luck. A partner there, again, a witness who got help. And you lived another 28 years, hips bolted onto the spine, a colostomy, a sphincter transplant that leaked, done in finally at 80, 80 by drowning in the fluid of your own brain. Suspended from two towers of grace, the span of your life hung. Where are you now, O oh twice survivor? Give me your altitude and velocity. The clouds here have condensed, rain, and slowly vanish into air. Tassels of the unmowed grass beside the roadway grasp the last few rays of sunlight and hold them, waving them before my eyes. And long contrails to somewhere stretch across heaven. As an example of how you can look at something different in the light of death, um, this next poem, I actually, heard, I actually got the title first and then realized I just have to write a poem to go with this title. Um, it's the happy insomniac. <laughs> These are not two words that usually go together. Um, the happy insomniac. I do not begrudge this solitude Bright star undimmed by other lights, its unsought and sunless solace at one with the animals of night who wander afield seeking their fill. The stuffed cranium of the study is dark and still, and all its purposes slumber. The inmate content to digest a scene he scarcely recognizes, lit by the shining of distant worlds. What a strange appetite is this for absences, loss, shimmerings beyond the failing empire of sight, the ghostly plume of a skunk's tail writing its scripture on the yard. Oh, surrounding, all-embracing void, accept the love of this brief life, this ignition of ashes bellowed by breath beneath the empty vault of your presence. I refuse no gift of wakefulness. <clears throat> so um, part of the story of this book is it ends in Shutesbury, <laughs> where I lived. I don't live there anymore, but I lived in Shutesbury for <laughs> 10 years. And um, for better or worse, bought a five-acre property <laughs> and uh, with a 200-year-old house and uh, kept it up. And, um, and one of the things that I learned from my father was to garden. And I love gardening. I love growing vegetables. And this is a poem that speaks to that called Planting Garlic. <clears throat> I love to imagine the first blind rootings in gravity's dark light, the sodden waiting, the slow ignition of their tiny green rockets as I bury their pink skinned cheeks in the corpse cold ground, soon freezing to stone. My neighbor says the mounded beds look like freshly dug graves. He's right. I am an undertaker for the living, consigning innocence to birth, not death, though not every womb is warm. Let this planting stand for all inhospitable beginnings for what shivers unseen awaiting its chance. Foot to shovel, back to wind, sky dour with coming rain, a few creaking pines, the hoarse whisper of corn stalks blowing, their dry matter to be thrown on the pile. I could work up a good sweat of melancholy here if wonder 
We're not constantly interrupting. I'm 50. I take no comfort in the rites of religion. Let me see the miracle before me, the one I too am. Let planting bring me to my knees. And I'll leave you with this last poem, um, which features my, my daughter, sort of indirectly, is dedicated to her, to Annie. On that aforementioned property, we had a horse. Um, and this is about the horse coming. The clearing. Late September. I'm in the pasture, tearing out old rusted wire, bittersweet vines and snare. Scores of saplings, puppies of the woods who know no bounds, poke eagerly through. The larger are ready to swallow the steel in their haste to thicken and rise. The air chilled by this morning's frost, our first. Grass soaked with the sweat of night. I'm stripped to t-shirt, biceps ache from squeezing loppers that sever the hopes of young wood to be forest. Back sore from heaving bottom wire, buried in ground and hoisting the chainsaw to chew the heftier fellows through. But there's nowhere I would rather be today than here, repairing the disregard of years, grateful for the strength of limb and will to push back the wood's encroachment, getting the fence ready for the new arrival, a horse whose coming gives this clearing purpose. Here is the freedom on this crisp day to work in my own field for my daughter's dream, to bask in the warmth of sun and a warmth within, twin hearths of nature, cozying up to a sense of blessing, knowing how a mind can feel cursed with toil, and I do sometimes curse the tenacity of trees. But today, as a yellow light glistens on leaves that tremble in what will soon undo them, I know I will not always be here. I am but a clearing between thick woods, a brief opening where the sun enters, of little consequence but unspeakable worth, happy to be fodder for the continuance of things. Thank you. Liz Leah Newman is the author of 65 books for readers of all ages, including the poetry collections, Still Life with Buddy, Nobody's Mother, Signs of Love, and October Morning, A Song for Matthew Shepard, novel in verse, which received a Stonewall honor from the American Library Association. Ms. Newman's literary awards include poetry fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Massachusetts Artist Foundation, the Bernie Bush Poetry Prize, and second place runner-up in the Solstice Literary Journal Poetry Competition. Her poetry has been published in Spoon River Review, Cimarron Review, Evergreen Chronicles, Lilith Magazine, Calliope, The Sun, Bark Magazine, Sal's Ear Poetry Review, Seventeen Magazine, and others. From 2008 to 2010, she served as the Poet Laureate of Northampton. Currently, she is a faculty member at Spalding University's Low Residency MFA um, in Writing Program. And her newest poetry collection, I Carry My Mother, is launching tonight. This is the book launch for I Carry My, Love, My Mother. These poems have a percussive insistence on rhyme, rhythm, and form that reflects both the relentlessness of mortality and the life's worth of turning to poems in harrowing moments. Leslie. Wow, oh my 
God, there's so many of you. <laughs> well, Susan said she was going to add only one sentence after my bio, and oh my God, what a gorgeous sentence. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Lisa, wherever you are. There you are. Mark, that was a holy reading. It was so beautiful. I'm really honored to read with you. It was just gorgeous. Um, I also want to thank um, Annabeth, is she here from the Cancer Connection? For, there she is, for supporting my book and my efforts. Um, and for every book sold tonight, I will give a dollar to the Cancer Connection. Um, my publishers who aren't here, here, Mary and Risa of Headmistress Press, did a fabulous job on my book. Mary Newman Vasquez helped me together. Um, all during my mom's illness and death and afterwards, so I appreciate that more than words can say. And thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, I'm not going to talk between poems, like most poets do, because my book has a narrative arc, which means it tells a story from beginning to end. So I'll just say a few things beforehand. Um, my mom and I had a complicated relationship. She was a complicated person, uh, but I was very lucky because we really resolved all our issues uh, before she died, and I had um, pretty much an entire decade of uh, really a pure, loving relationship with her. And uh, at the end of her life, during her last hospital stay, she called me into the room and she said, I want you to write about all of this, meaning everything that happened to her under one condition, promise me I'll never have to read it. <laughs> and so, uh, I am one to always take any writing assignment seriously, and so uh, this book is the result of, of her wish. So, um, <clears throat> my mom died of uh, cancer and COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. She was sick for 10 years. She was a lifelong smoker, two packs a day, Chesterfield King non-filtered cigarettes, so that is pretty much um, was the cause of her illnesses. Um, and I miss her. The deal. My mother's doctor tells me, here's the deal. She has six months to live, a year at most. His words lodge in my gut, a heavy meal. My mother's doctor tells me, here's the deal. I'm very sorry, I know how you feel. But keep your chin up, don't give up the ghost. My mother's doctor tells me, here's the deal. She's got six months to live, a year at most. A daughter's a daughter. My mother declares in her hospital room that my fate was decided deep down in her womb. A son is a son until he takes a wife, a daughter's a daughter for all of her life. She's telling me I am in charge of her fate while both of my brothers are deemed second rate. As she's born unto death, I will be her midwife, a daughter's a daughter for all of her life. I argue, I reason, I try as I might. I learn from the best how to put up a fight. My mother and I are no strangers to strife. A daughter's a daughter for all of her life. The papers are signed, I'm to do as she said. If she cannot be cured, she would rather be dead. Can I cut the cord of her life with a knife? A daughter's a daughter for all of her life. Precious mother. The daughter's heart aches, the daughter's heart breaks as she wakes and takes care of her mother. Heavy with dread, she creeps to the bed. Is she dead or is she my mother? Hands cold as stone, she feels all alone, sitting bone to bone with her mother. Eyes full of tears, mind full of fears, how to get through the years without mother. The months have been rough, and though she's been tough, enough is enough for a mother. This much is clear, the time's drawing near. Is there anything dear as a mother? Her face thin and frail, her life growing stale, her body a jail for the mother. Will her suffering cease? Will she ever know peace? Can she bear to release her own mother? Too frail to speak, so withered and weak, the future looks bleak for a mother. The hope is long past, the daughter clings fast to what's left of the last of her mother. Moon rising high, the daughter must try to whisper goodbye to her mother. Star shining bright, her mother takes flight. Godspeed and good night, precious mother. In the ICU, <clears throat> my mother is awake and not awake. My mother is asleep and not asleep. My mother is alive and not alive. The clock is moving and not moving. The monitor is beeping and not beeping. The nurse is coming and not coming. Time is passing and not passing. 
My mother is seeing and not seeing. My mother is hearing and not hearing. My mother is breathing and not breathing. I am seeing her face and not seeing her face. I am hearing her voice and not hearing her voice. I am squeezing her hand and not squeezing her hand. I am beside her and beside myself. I am an orphan and I am not an orphan. I am a daughter and I am not a daughter. I am a child and I am not a child. Her daughter, her child. Once, once my mother pushed my stroller, now I push my mother's wheelchair. Once my mother fed me ice cream, now I feed my mother ice chips. Once my mother wore evening gowns, now my mother wears hospital gowns. Once my mother danced all night, now my mother vomits all night. Once my mother dyed her hair black, now my mother's urine is black. Once my mother watched Jeopardy each night, now my mother is in Jeopardy each night. Once my mother was dying to live, now my mother is dying to die. It's time. My mother, pale and frail and old, her hands and feet so blue and cold, she looks at me with one dark eye. It's time, she says, for me to die. I know her life's a bitter pill. I know this has been coming still. How on earth to say goodbye? It's time, she says, for me to die. It's time, she says, for you to live. You've given all you've got to give. Just promise me that you won't cry. It's time, she says, for me to die. She lays her hand upon my face. My shattered heart begins to race. My cheeks are anything but dry. It's time, she says, for me to die. She turns from me and whispers, go, her breath as soft and still as snow. Her final words, a whispered sigh. It's time, she says, for me to die. <clears throat> Beaten. My mother, shriveled, shrunken, gray, lies motionless upon the bed, a tiny mottled lump of clay. She looks like she's already dead, her hands and feet so blue and cold, her bloodless lips no longer red. Her wedding band of tarnished gold, long banished from her waxy hand, too curled and stiff for me to hold. She lies in wait for God's command to leave us for the world to come, that fabled perfect promised land. An eye so hollowed out and numb sits still beside her standing guard, my heart a beaten battered drum, my life like hers a broken shard. Vigil. May she go easy, may she go swift, may she not tremble as things start to shift. May she go gentle as sweet summer rain. May she be free of her heart-wrenching pain. May she go calm as the moon in the sky, beaming above us, may she not cry. May she go quick as a thief in the night. May she believe that we'll all be all right. May she go free as a bird that has flown with joy from the nest to test waters unknown. May she go light, may her burdens release. May she grieve nothing, may she know peace. May she go soft as a blanket of snow. May she go easy, may she let go. How to watch your father, watch your mother die. Sit beside him on a folding chair beside your mother's bed. Place a box of tissues between you. See how he takes your mother's hand in both his own and strokes it like a small wounded animal. Do not speak. Do not turn on the TV. Do not shatter the silence around you. Let time pass. Listen to your father sigh, listen to your father sob. Hand your father a tissue whenever necessary. Ask your father if he wants something to eat. Ask your father if he wants something to drink. Ask your father if he wants to go for a walk. Do not press him when he says no to everything. Remember, the one thing he wants is impossible to give him. Let more time pass. When your father gets up to go to the bathroom and says, Hold mom's hand, hold your mother's hand. When he returns, give your mother's hand back to your father. It belongs to him. Do not tell your father what the hospice nurse told you. You need to let go so she can let go. When the sun sets, gather the darkened room around your shoulders like a cloak. Watch your father's undying love. Take your mother's breath away.
a New York Minute. She was just here and now she's just gone. In a New York Minute, I lost my mother. How can the rest of the world carry on? She was just here and now she's just gone. On whose loving breast will my head rest upon? I'll search all of my life, but I won't find another. She was just here and now she's just gone. In a New York Minute, I lost my mother. Looking at her. Yes, I was looking at her. Yes, I knew her very well. Yes, I had lived inside of her. Yes, I had lived outside of her. Yes, she had fed me and clothed me. Yes, she had rocked me and soothed me. Yes, I had brought her much pleasure. Yes, I had brought her much pain. Yes, we had fought with great fury. Yes, we had kissed and made up. Yes, I had moved far away from her. Yes, I remained very close to her. Yes, that day I was looking at her. Yes, she was stiff and unmoving. Yes, she was dressed in a shroud. Yes, her two lips stitched together. Yes, her two eyelids sewn shut. Yes, I bent over her casket. Yes, I applied her pink lipstick. Yes, I brushed blush on her cheekbones. Yes, the farewell, the departure. Yes, the silence, the longing. Yes, I was with and without her. Yes, I was looking at her. My mother has my heart. My mother has my heart and I have hers. We traded on the day that she gave birth. Each passing year, the line between us blurs until the day I lay her in the earth. My heart in her now cracked and split in two, her heart in me now wound down like a clock. As she and I turn into something new, the love between us hardens into rock. My heart in her, a newborn morning dove, still safely tucked inside its sheltered nest. Her heart in me, a letter signed with love, a treasure I keep deep within my chest. From this day forth, whatever else occurs, my mother has my heart and I have hers. Missed by. The chair near the window, its back and seat cold, the shawl that no longer has shoulders to hold, the black purse you held like a cat in your lap, the side of the bed where you no longer nap, the wooden mezuzah you hung by the door, the red and gold rug that you hooked for the floor. The cup marked the boss which you drank from each night. The tea and the sugar know something's not right. The telephone pines for the sound of your laugh. The tub longs to draw you a warm, sudsy bath. The kitchen you ruled with your big wooden spoon is holding out hope you'll return to us soon. Unable to take in the news of your death, your house sits on tender hooks holding its breath. Sitting Shiva. Mirrors are covered, wooden benches are set out. Have a good morning. Where's the coffee pot? I ask my father, who knows? My mother would know. Welcome, please come in, sit anywhere, except there. That's my mother's chair. Ancient Hebrew prayers cannot bring my mother back, so what good are they? My aunt spills her tea when I speak to her softly in my mother's voice. White coffee cups smeared with my mother's red lipstick. Don't you dare wash it. Chocolate rugelach my mother and I both love clog my throat like mud. My mother's old friend cups my face with wilted hands, fingers wet with tears. My aunt stands to, stands to leave. Call if you need anything. I need my mother. One more thing. My mother crept downstairs at night. I made believe I was asleep. She didn't bother with the light. Her need for solitude ran deep. She smoked a cigarette or two. She drank a tepid cup of tea. And then with nothing left to do, at last she let herself just be. For hours lost in thought she sat, the kitchen quiet as a grave. Was she content or sorry that for years she gave and gave and gave? I missed my chance to ask her, so that's one more thing I'll never know. Stopping by dreams on a lonely evening. 
Whose face this is, I think I know, I recognize from long ago. My mother cannot really be, for days on end I've missed her so. For nights on end so desperately I've shut my eyes in hopes to see my mother smiling with delight and reaching out her hand to me. She floats by in a shroud of white and whispers, hush now, I'm all right. You promised me you wouldn't weep, and then she disappears from sight. My dream is lovely, dark, and deep, and I've a promise now to keep, and years to hold her in my sleep, and years to hold her in my sleep. Beacon. Cold, dark, wintry night, who will light the way for me? The mom in the moon. My mother would not stop for death. <laughs> My mother would not stop for death, and so he stopped, for she was ready for that final breath and eager to be free. Death pulled into the parking lot and climbed the narrow stair to find the room that time forgot. My mother waited there. In sleek black tux, top hat and shoes, more handsome than a groom, a gent nobody could refuse, death strode into the room. And though my mother lay abed, death swept her off her feet, in one swift moment, they were wed, my mother's life complete. The couple hastened out the door, he held her by the hand. Now she and death, her paramour, dwell in the promised, promised land. That morning was so long ago, yet feels like yesterday, when death became my mother's bow and stole her straight away. Yard Sight. Golden autumn leaves drift lazily through the air, onto mother's grave. White winter snowflakes fall all over themselves to blanket mother's grave. Gentle spring raindrops are sent down from the heavens to wash mother's grave. Warm summer breezes chase pale yellow butterflies around mother's grave. Today marks a year. Endless tears soak one small stone placed on mother's grave. This is the last poem, I Carry My Mother. <clears throat> I carry my mother wherever I go, her belly, her thighs, her plentiful hips, her milky white skin she called this side of snow, the crease of her brow and the plump of her lips, her belly, her thighs, her plentiful hips, the curl of her hair and her sharp widow's peak, the crease of her brow and the plump of her lips, the hook of her nose and the curve of her cheek. The curl of her hair and her sharp widow's peak, the dark beauty mark to the left of her chin, the hook of her nose and the curve of her cheek, her delicate wrist so impossibly thin, the dark beauty mark to the left of her chin, her deep set brown eyes that at times appeared black, her delicate wrist so impossibly thin, I stare at the mirror, my mother stares back. Her deep set brown eyes that at times appeared black, her milky white skin she called this side of snow, I stare at the mirror, my mother stares back, I carry my mother wherever I go. Thank you. Q&A, and don't forget, there'll be books for sale after. If you need to leave early and want to get a book, it's fine to do it now <laughs> um, while that happens. Um, I'm going to start with a question. And usually, I try an easy question. But for you to know we're going to go right for <laughs> um, You know, I was really struck when Leslie said that uh, Mark's reading was holy. I felt like both readings were holy. Can you talk a little about your sense of the relationship between poetry and the sacred, if you feel there is one? Mm -hmm. um, but if you read my poetry, almost every poem is about the sacred. And I also love using religious language in contexts where you don't expect it. Um, to sort of draw the bridge in people's minds between um, the sacred and the ordinary. 
And I think that poets are, so, there's a sort of an unofficial religion of poetry if you start to, if you start to get into it. Um, it offers a certain kind of solace. It offers a certain kind of um, connectedness that is uh, very much what spiritual practices are about. Well, interesting you ended with the word spiritual practice. It's like, I feel writing poetry is my spiritual practice. Um, it's always where I go to to connect to something larger than myself. I have no idea where poems come from. And I feel like anytime anyone creates something out of nothing, it's a holy experience. And so I find that um, when I'm alone with my pen and some kind of spirit that comes through me, that's where I, I feel most connected to, to, actually to the whole world, to myself, to other people, to whatever I believe in um, is the root of all of this, and uh, to my mom. Questions, responses? Carolyn. I was struck by the death of the cold womb, and I think you were starting on this theme, but why is death particularly the cold womb for you using for, for, for poetry, for writing, for any other thing? Cold womb. That you're saying? Yeah, well, in, the, in the poem Planting Garlic, um, not every womb is warm. This is the line, yeah. And um, I feel that a lot of my writing, I don't, it's, you know, I don't know where the writing comes from either. It is a very mysterious thing. But something uh, has digested a great deal of, of pain and heartache and so forth, and it comes through, through the writing. And so the womb of the writing is not always just the sunny spot. It's, uh, it's often the thing that is hardest to digest. And something works on it, and it may take years, but at a certain point, something is ready to come to you. Sure. Yeah, Mark, that poem struck me also. And the, uh, the I'm looking for the right word. I'm not finding it. Uh, the, the interposition, the, the flipping around of the concepts of birth and death in a grave, it was a really fresh perspective for me. And um, I also happened to have planted garlic in the fall, which I had not done before. Mm -hmm. um, so I was thinking about how those garlics are doing under these three feet of snow that's on top of them. So I just wanted to thank you for giving me that fresh perspective. You're welcome. And they'll do just fine under the snow. They'll do better than if it's no snow and very, very cold. <laughs> it's a great way. Yeah. Hi, um, Isaiah. I was noticing that you used a lot of really structured poetry in this book. When I was in high school, a poetry teacher said um, that she wrote villanelles whenever she was grieving or something oh. because the, you knew how they ended. Catch you on the ball. I was wondering if you had anything like that or why you were using the structured poetry. If you can hear, the question is about why I wrote um, the poems in formal poetry. Um, First of all, I don't know why more poets don't write formal poetry. I just love it so much. And for me, especially when I'm just grieving, you know, in such a profound way for my mother, my emotions are just all over the place, so I needed a structured container to pour them into. And, the, and writing in form did two things for me. It brought me closer to my emotions because I had to keep going over and over and over them to find the right word but it also distanced me from them because I was thinking about things like line breaks and enjambment and rhyme. So, so there's some kind of tension there which maybe comes through in the poems. But I think the forms really kept me together. They kept the, my poetry together and, and my, myself together. Something else? Um, I've got one for Leslie, sort of going back to death, his womb. Uh, you were, poem once, and maybe other poems sort of do that too, in that, you know, the reversal of the role of the mother and the daughter. Um, is that, did, is that an accurate reading of your poem? I mean, do you, did you feel that reversal? Well, yeah, I wound up taking care of my mother um, on many levels, certainly on a physical level, um, on an emotional level, as much as she would let me, because she was very tough, you know, no crying, she forbid me to cry. <laughs> Um, 
Um, I think, I hope, I offered comfort to her. Um, you know, I told her I would take care of my dad, which I am doing. Um, so I, I do think there was some reversal in roles, but I never for a minute forgot that she was the mother and I was the daughter. Anything else? Questions? Responses? Ellen. Susan, this is for you. Did you say that the mother and the daughter at Bridge Street died on the same day? They did. Do you know why? I don't know. Someone should, if Elise was here, she could tell us, I bet. probably think he's had some microphones. Yeah, right. Maybe we could find out. 1882, May, but why? And one was in France and was in Cambridge. I assumed England, but maybe that. Maybe it was Cambridge, Massachusetts. Why? Yeah, and I, because I was thinking like a buggy tip over, but then in light of the measles and everything, because I was thinking of infectious diseases. Yeah, right, and right. One was caring for the other with typhus or something, and it made me think of Leslie. Caring for her mom. Oh, right. And the risks of caring for a loved one. It just, I saw the connection there. Yeah. And now I must know. Yeah, well, if you find out, tell us, all right? <laughs> Post it on Facebook. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Did you have something? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Leslie, I just wanted to thank you and uh, remind you, in case you forget, uh, of what um, magnitude you have. I don't like poetry, I've never liked poetry. And so I thought it was interesting that this turned out to be a poetry thing. But, um, but what I, uh, and, you know, no offense, I'm just interested. So, <laughs> and I'm taken. Um, but what I thought was interesting or helpful was that both of the uh, of you tonight, uh, I understood the poetry and I was very moved by it. And so I think I just am looking at the wrong poetry. Mm. So. Mm. <laughs> Score. <laughs> um, but, but anyway, I just uh, am grateful to you, and I, it's nice to be in the same communities, have access to you in, in person. And I'm sure there's people all over the country who pick up your work and, and you never know, get a chance to meet you. So I think it's an honor to have you here. That is so nice. Thank you, Joe. Can I ask you about accessibility? Do you think about making your poems, both of you, inviting to people, understandable to people? Is that one of the things you consider in your writing process? Absolutely. I, I, I don't see any reason to write a poem people can't understand. And um, one of my beefs with the contemporary poetry world is that poets are writing for other poets. Yeah. They don't actually care what people who aren't poets want to read. And I would like to think that I wrote a book that people who aren't poets would like to read. And, um, and some of the best compliments I've gotten are from people who say something like, I don't like poetry, I never read poetry. I picked up your book and I read it cover to cover and couldn't put it down. And that, to me, is probably the nicest thing that anybody could say. It's <laughs> <laughs> a movement, right? <laughs> I actually um, dropped out of a master's in creative writing program, which ironically now I teach in one, not the one I dropped out of. <laughs> but because what was happening was, the more you couldn't understand a poem, the higher in esteem it was held. And I didn't get that. And I was just feeling dumber and dumber. So I just left and started reading poetry that I could understand, and I was really determined that my poetry would be poetry that could be understood by people who didn't have any kind of fancy degree. Um, I absolutely wanted to touch people's hearts. I wanted it to be easy to understand. I wanted it to be finely crafted. But I want it to be accessible, and I absolutely think about that when I write it. Are, are there poets that y'all love? Can you recommend some poets to us? Mark Hart. I love <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's po there are poets in this room. Gail Thomas is a fantastic poet, and she has a book coming out soon. Ellen LaFleche in the back is a fantastic poet. We are a very rich community of poets. I'm sure there are others in here. Forgive me if I'm not mentioning you. Well, I'll name two of my favorites. Seamus Haney, mm -hmm. and um, <coughs> I'm blanking on his name, Tom Thomas Tranströmer, who is a Swedish poet. Um, he has a wonderful translator. And his book, The Great Enigma, collects most of his poems. And um, 
Those are the two writers that when I pick them up, I love lots of poets, but those are the two writers when I pick them up, there might just be a word or a couple of words they will use that will send me to writing. It will, it will open up some kind of metaphorical intelligence in my mind and I will want to start writing and that, those two poems, those two poets do it most consistently. Yes. I think oh. you both succeeded very well and your personalities emerged very clearly. I think I have a vision of your father, the leading this man, the remember his product, and Leslie, um, I met her mother and I know her well, and I think she succeeded in sharing this all. It is very deep and sad, but beautiful. Thank you. Yes, sir. Just to add a little levity, <laughs> I'd like to make an observation. Uh, I see at the front near, near the four chairs near the table. It would have been nice to, to be sat, sat if only to be able. <laughs> it rhymes. I know it rhymes. <laughs> OK. And is there anything else? Shelf. Sure. Yeah, just to go back to Mark's comment about accessibility, I have been accused many times of being too journalistic as a poet. Um, but I will say, I think there is a place for poetry that isn't necessarily comprehensible because it comes from some deep part of the soul that needs to get out somehow. It doesn't mean necessarily you have to publish it or read it, but I, I have had some of my most powerful experiences as a poet working from dreams, if I can remember them long enough to get a pen and paper. Um, but. Again, as I said, I'm, I'm somebody who's, the stuff that I read in public, people say, well, you're a journalist, and it shows. OK. Um, any more questions or comments? OK. So thank you so much for Leslie and Mark. Thank you. Books for sale by both poets. They'll be signing up front at that table. And there's refreshments in the gallery and the friends of the library are also at the gallery if you want to talk to them.